Hello and welcome to Mix Bus with me, Kevin Paul. This series aims to allow some of the best producers, mixers, engineers and other music industry people to discuss their careers and their approach to music. The success of this series depends on people hearing it, so don't forget to tell your friends if you like what you hear and remember to give it a five-star rating and please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice to make sure you don't miss out on future episodes, special offers and promotions. This episode is brought to you in association with KMR, the UK's leading independent pro audio retailer and recorded in association with Audient and the ID44. Find out more at kpmixbus.com and follow us on facebook.com slash kpmixbus and at kpmixbus on Instagram and Twitter. Today's guest is Alan Mulder. Alan is Britain's premier alternative rock producer, mixer and engineer. Alan has been at the helm of some of Rock's most iconic records. His production, mixing and engineering credits include Nine Inch Nails, The Killers, The Smashing Pumpkins, Foo Fighters, Them Crooked Vultures, My Bloody Valentine, The Jesus and Mary Chain, Arctic Monkeys, Led Zeppelin, Death Cab for Cutie, Foles, Royal Blood, Circle Waves, Two Door Cinema Club, Twin Atlantic, Ride, Queens of the Stone Age, Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes and Suede. Hello, Alan. Great to be here. Thanks for being on Mix Bus. First question, what went wrong with your career? <laughs> I've been very lucky. Um, I started at a time when alternative music wasn't really something everybody wanted to do. It was actually something people tended to avoid, or it was kind of known more as indie rock then. Mm -hmm. And I started in 84, and people in those days were kind of into being Trevor Horn and making those great big slick productions which you know i like and everyone wanted to show off being an engineer their prowess mm. and nobody really wanted to do the indie records because they generally didn't sound very good so i kind of liked that music and i got into it through i knew alan mcgee from who owned creation records alan mcgee and dick green i went to school with dick green in Lincolnshire, weirdly enough. And so we knew each other before they had Creation Records. So when they formed Creation Records and I was at Trident, I was kind of a, a trained engineer, which generally the indie bands couldn't afford. They, they went to smaller studios. So I got to work with some Creation bands and I said, there was no comp real competition, you know, nobody really wanted to do that stuff, and I loved it, so I started, it was me and Flood, basically, we both, right. we were the two who liked that kind of weirdo music, as they called it, <laughs> and uh, so we got, a, we got a flying start, then Nirvana came along, and suddenly alternative rock and indie rock, you know, suddenly people were selling records, and then all the big engineers wanted to do those records but flood and i had got the track history from the valentines in the mary chain and with flood the mute bands that he did yeah. so we had a good head start so i think that worked out well for it yeah is that where you started at trident i started at trident yeah, yeah. and and what was that like it was for the most exciting years of my life i didn't still? sleep yeah still still, yeah. still i didn't sleep I didn't make any money. I was poverty stricken, but we learned this the atmosphere in the studio was great. We had, I mean, the people that were there at the time. This flood was the, the main guy. He was the head engineer. There was we had Spike Stent, we had Chenzo Tans, and Steve Osborne, Paul Corkit. I'm sure I've missed some people out, but it was a pretty good roster of people there, and we we're all great friends. Yeah. Everyone was still in competition with everyone, but it yeah. was not a backbiting competition. It was very supportive. Sure. But if anyone made a mistake, it travelled around the building very quickly and everyone took the piss <laughs> massively. So it was it was tough, but it was really good fun. I learned so much. Yeah. I'd finally found the job that I wanted to do. I started late. I didn't start till I was 24. Suddenly I found this thing that I fell in love with and just devoted all my life to did you have any idea that you wanted to to be a, a, in the studio or how did you get to that trident place at 24 i'd been in local bands in boston lincolnshire where i'm from and uh, you know you always dream of making it in a band and yeah it's not gonna happen there but you know it, certainly in those days it wasn't gonna happen and then i went into a studio 
and saw that to do a demo and just thought, I like this, you yeah. know, this you is like this is great. And then uh, I just kind of realised, I was working for the Ministry of Agriculture at the time, and I kind of realised, you know, what am I doing? You know, this is, I didn't, I liked the job, but, mm. you know, I didn't want to do it for the rest of my life. And I thought, well, just take a risk and just, those days you just got a job in the studio, there weren't all the schools, it was only the Tom Meister course, and I didn't do A-level music or math, so I wasn't going to do that. That's the one at Surrey University. Surrey University, yeah. 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 That was the... Still going. Yes. Still good, but it was more for BBC type people then. Okay. So you just got a job in studios and assistant in those days, or T-boy as it was. It used yeah. to be the runner, as they're now. We used to call them T-boys. And I managed to get a job and that was it. I just... This, I thought, this is heaven. First day in a studio, Monday, I think it was Monday the 2nd of December. I turned up at 9 o'clock and left 9 o'clock the next morning. Wow, that's a great start. It was, that was baptisms <laughs> of a fight, but it was brilliant. You know. So you worked at Trident for four years, yeah, and you obviously you, you managed to stay the distance, as it were. Yeah. What happened then? Did you just go freelance? Did you move well, to another they studio? they sold, Trident got sold. They sold it to another company, Audio One, I think, and they, they kept one of the buildings, so, but basically it sold. So I was lucky enough that I'd got enough clients that I could keep going. I got managed by David Stewart from the... Eurythmics. Okay. He set up a management company because he got so much work that he couldn't do. He wanted a management company of people that he could give work to. Mm. My now wife and then girlfriend was in was signed to his label, so he knew me from working on her albums, yeah. Tony Halliday. Yeah. And uh, so he took me on, and so I got to work with Eurythmics and some of his bands that were on Anxious Label, yeah. and his then wife at the time Siobhan Farhid so I did Shakespeare's sister so I worked on her albums too and and the record industry then was was a very different thing wasn't it it was yeah people couldn't spend their money on video games and no, streaming and stuff you know music it. was the primary kind of form of entertainment it was it, um, it was things that people turned to yeah the industry had huge budgets to make really great records yeah obviously we're still making great records we just don't have that budget anymore no all time all time yes indeed how do you balance that level of expectation where, you know, like you say, huge budgets, lots of time, mm -hmm. we're now in the 2000 and whatever, 19. How do you manage to still produce the same quality of work without that budget? You must have had to change maybe your style or oh, your yeah, workflow yeah. or what would have happened to yeah, you? Yeah, you to have to adapt. You definitely yeah. have to adapt. We're lucky enough to have this studio. Yeah. So I've got a, a great room which has got a great mixing desk in it. We've, we've stuck to the the old big desks. I, mean, I still I work in the box, but I've got the desk. I've got lots of outboard gear. I've been lucky enough to accumulate. So I have a room that it enables me to have a quality. Mm. And I've got Caesar, who I work with, who's my an engineer I work with, that we can split the flow. If there's, I can yeah. do, I can assign work to him yeah. that enables us to get things done quicker. So I can, sure. we can work on two things at once or we can and i've got tom now i've got we've got people that enable you to certain things you can delegate yes okay yeah, which sure. i've had been with caesar for eight years so mm. i've come as close to cloning myself as i, I can do <laughs> and so having great staff in a great studio really helps yes. we, we make flood and i make no money from this place because yeah. running costs and everything these days but it's worth it because it facilitates just to keep, just to keep the keep the standards yes, as high. Yeah. We, we've got a great tracking room upstairs, so yeah, with a great board there. So we've got we've got the stuff that enables us to make the records we want to make without having to pay another studio. I don't know how running this place. I don't know how studios work as a as a as, as a going as concern. a going concern because yeah. I know what running this place costs yeah. and. You know, it's it's, it's tight, easy. and yeah. and we're we're pretty full. You know, we're pretty busy. So I don't know how they do it. Is it fair to say that you mainly do a lot of mixing now? I do do more mixing, yeah, than production. Is that something you sought to do, or you just sort of fell into, or and you know, is is that where you're most happiest in the studio? It is where I'm most happiest. I think it's come from my time at Trident. I got when I joined, they'd just taken on the second studio which was in victoria and it had an ssl it was the first ssl trident hat 
and I, and they just opened it. And I got sent over there at the beginning and I learned the desk really quick. I'd, I worked out, right. nobody really knows how to use this. Right. So I learned it really quick. So I ended up, if there was a session in there, I got put on it because I knew the studio. Okay. And those days people would come in to try, they'd have to come in for a day yeah. to try the studio out and they'd probably, some people coming in to try the try SSLs out. So I managed to get a good grasp on that room. Yeah, sure. Took the initiative. I took, yeah. yeah. I, I learned it and it worked out great because I got all the sessions in there. Right. And they were the be best paying sessions there and the best clients. But the downside was people would come in for a day mm. and that would mean they'd work 24 hours and then I'd have to work the next day. So, yeah. so you didn't get much sleep, but it enabled me to learn that console really well. And so I ended up spending a lot of my time mixing as a mixing assistant rather than a tracking assistant. Okay. So I think that's probably where it came from in the first place. Yeah. And now I kind of, I kind of like it. I think, I think it's what I'm best at. I like producing. Yeah. But it has to, I know the bands that I think I'll be good for a producer yeah. to produce. And I know the ones that I don't think I'll be able to provide what they need or want. So it's kind of both things, but I, I do, I like it. I like the yeah. fact that... I prefer mixing. It's just, for me, it's somewhere where I can, I feel I can add the most value. And it's down to, at the end of the yeah. day, I like the challenge that it's down to you. Yeah. You, if you've got to get the thing past the post, you, every day you've got to hit the ball out of the park. You've yeah. got to get a tick. Sure. So it's a challenge. It's, a, yeah. you know, and I, I like that. You get addicted to that kind of Yeah, yeah, for sure. You, do, you definitely get addicted to that kind of expectation and, yeah. and desire. We spoke a little bit about the studio here. Yeah. How long have you and Flood been in charge of this place? We started off taking on my mix room downstairs. That's the first room we took on. I think that was about 15 years ago, I think. And that was the only room we had here. And slowly, we've taken over most of the rooms in the building. We've, After that, we took over this room, A uh, and B2, the, the yeah. tracking room, which was run by Barney, who's the tech staff. And uh, we put a neve console in and we got our tracking room which would the idea was downstairs would be my room the upstairs would be flood's room okay but obviously when you're a producer you can't always dictate where band's going to record you can suggest it but obviously flood couldn't be here all the time so then we ended up taking over the some of the programming rooms as well so we had one downstairs a studio we called dave which Catherine marks is in okay. she's just taking that on offers so that she's, she's has that on her own we've got an, another couple of studios which we've got uh, other people in we've got um a band called the afterward in one yeah. and tim across is in the one across the road yeah and spike stents got the one next door which yeah. he his guy dave uh, does a lot of his tweaks for uh, labels who are in England when he's in America. And Spike, Spike will use it sometimes, but it's kind of yeah. a mixture between Dave and Spike. So, so that's like almost like a, a reunion, really, of the Trident. Yeah, it's it? great. He just it's... he just wanted to be in a building where yeah. um, his friends were. For sure, yeah. Why not? So it yeah. all goes back. We're still. It's just one of those things. You know, it's like in this business, you don't see people one of your people yeah. for years, but you when you meet up, it's. You back where you, yeah. you know, you back to where back you were. Back to where you were, yeah. yeah. And uh, so you took over the studio, and you know, you've you've turned this into a, from from what I can see, you've turned this into a, a real place where, a place of creativity. Yeah. You know, like, as you say, you've got incredibly talented people working here. We have, yeah. Really. And you have a very good program of bringing people through. Um, you, you, we spoke about Catherine. Yeah, you got Caesar, who yeah. you said Cecil's Cecil Bartlett. Up, up, Cecil up Adam Bartlett. He's well. He's doing very well. He's been working with a lot of a lot of artists. He's very respected. He, he's great. He's been. He's just great producer in the making. If I'm looking to get a job in the studio, mm -hmm. and somehow I wind up at the door of Battery, what are you looking for from me? What makes you decide to hire Tom as opposed to hire somebody else? What 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 is it that you're looking for in in a, an assistant to come into the studio? Is it education from college? Is it something no, else? What, what would, are you looking for? It's their personality. It's funny because all that we got a lot of people there, and they're all completely different. 
right. completely different people and personalities. But there's all there's a there's a common thread of their passion for what they do that they they all have. Everyone's got that same ambition and passion. So I'm looking for some. We look for uh, some of them have been to school. Some of them haven't been to school. It makes no difference to us because really they're still gonna. They they they, they learn technique from school and they learn the, you know technical cool stuff which is great yeah but they don't learn how to be in a session and they don't learn a lot of the other stuff that yeah. we take for granted so you kind of start in from the ground up already okay so again. you sort of strip them all back down and say well, okay right they, they, there park, is park I got what you've learned I got Caesar they, they generally come on work experience. Okay. That's, that's how oh, we okay. generally find them on work oh, right. experience. So I know people say about the work experience thing being a bad thing. Yeah. Not for the people who've come here. Yeah, sure. We've got them all from work experience. Yeah. Uh, Catherine came over from Australia just to work with Flood, and then she ended up with me. And then Caesar came from work experience from Lipper, and he knew so much about computers, I thought, we need a guy to run our rigs. Okay. I think Flood took on Cecil, and I took on Caesar. Yeah. And they, they come in for the... We just see something in the people. Okay. And Tom, same thing. He comes in, his knowledge of music is amazing, his depth of knowledge of music. He used to think, okay, well, that guy has got an ear. He, he, he understands it. Yeah, he understands yeah. it. And it's just... You just get a feeling from them. Sure. And what ends up is the... They end up not going home, or they 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 turn up and they won't go. <laughs> so you end up having having to employ them, kind of. <laughs> I guess it's that doggedness, though, that actually shows shows their desire. You that's know, the, it. You, know, you, you spot the ones. The guy that wants to leave at five o'clock. That's it. The guns who come and work experience at leave on the dot of five. Yeah. You're not going to warm to them as much as yeah. the one who's there till. I mean, some of them have to get leave at five because they've got to get home yeah, or whatever. Course, yeah, but, of course, but yeah. As a generalisation, you, you you spot the ones that are really in it for the right reasons. And sometimes with work experience, you get people come in and at the end of it they go, I've realised this job isn't for me. Sure. Because, as you yeah. know, it's it's not for everyone, this. If you don't absolutely love it, it's going to, you know, it's going to kill you. Well, it's a lifestyle, isn't it? It is, yeah. It, it's, it's, not, it's a vocation. Yeah. That's what I, I see anyway. And between Flood and I, if they... We always try and make sure that they work for both of us. Okay. Because we are very, very different how we work. And it teaches them completely different things, which I think is a very, gives them a much rounder education. How do you work? I'm very methodical. Okay. Can you, like a can classic you maybe, mixed engineer. Can very, you maybe describe that a, a little bit deeper? Like, so... You're, you're mixing a band, for instance. Do you have a, a set way of working in terms of approaching a song? Or? It's just how it's set up. I want it set up a certain way just from a start. But I, when I actually approach it to mix it, no, it's it's not really the same. Not really the same. Uh, I try and, if I do an album, to give, give each album a different kind of, okay, I'm going to use more different stuff on this or something just oh, to, to, okay. keep, to keep me interested really as much as anything yeah so it's not it's not mixing by numbers and no, it, you know I so can't, you, yeah. I've tried that I can't do it it doesn't <laughs> work but uh, so I'm very organised and very structured you, you mean with your pro tools or your desk everything or your, kind of is were... tidy and kind of okay we okay. have a system okay and uh, that's kind of thing flood is chaos and his genius comes from managing to ha work in this chaos where everyone thinks, what the fuck is happening? And uh, suddenly something great appears. So they learn both sides mm -hmm. and the value yeah. of both sides. Sure. How do you encourage those people that work with you to venture out? They're almost like like your children in some way yeah yeah you know and, and you you've you've spent a lot of time nurturing them and, and showing them the studio how do you sort of encourage them to go out into the world what's what's their well i you, mean i know you're not necessarily responsible f for that for them building their careers but you you obviously have an influence to them we introduce them to clients right you know and so they get to meet people and we actively promote them when we are okay uh have yeah. record companies or bands 
And so they'll probably end, they'll start off then maybe doing B-sides for them or live mixes. Yeah. They start to get our client base, which, feed them in. which you feed them in. So yeah. then they start, then the record company will be aware of them. And so they'll think, okay, well, let's give them, you know, we've only got this amount of money, let's try yeah. these people. So Excellent. we kind of pass on our clients to them. Yeah. And then it gets to a point where they get taken out of the studio, they want to take them on to do a project somewhere else. Yeah. And so they get their own clients and they, and then it and kind then of off. goes off. What I do love about this place is they come back to work in the rooms and yeah. they, they've, we try and provide this as a home or a base for them to come yeah. back to because what's great is you're in a room, there's, all, there's people around all the time. Yeah. This place, isn't, as you can see, we don't spend money on the decor. The doghouse, which flood, which is a, an old tape store, which we've converted into a room because floods, flood was ending up run, running out of time on album or budget on albums. So we managed to create a room for him where he could finish them off. The kind of well, when, think, it, yeah. when the budget had gone, and so we got these little rooms that people go in and just make music, and it's great. So, I mean, yeah, people who come here either get it or they don't. They either, they either miss, they either don't like Wilsden. And, yeah. and yeah. it's not plush enough for them, yeah. or they just get a sense of the building and, and yeah. the creativity. We had Duran Duran here this this year a lot. Oh, what was which, that like? Well, I thought they're going to hate it. They're, 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 <laughs> you know, this ain't Rio. You know, no, you just, you just sure. think of their videos. Yeah, and they loved it, and they keep they come back because oh, they get the place, which was a joy to us. Well, well, that's 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 the highest compliment, isn't it? When it people is. come back, yeah. When you start a mix, what? Uh, first the first thing I thoughts? do is I listen to the the reference mix yeah. from top to bottom. Okay. And then I will decide whether I'm going to mix it on the board or in the box. Sometimes I'll break it out at the desk. I'll put print it in the box, at the, the, a mix in the box, and then yeah. I'll break it out on the desk and just run it through the desk yeah. and listen to the two and decide which, is, which suits it better. Okay. Sometimes budget will dictate whether I just go straight in the box because it takes longer the desk because if I'm using the desk I'll get it to a point then it'll be stemmed extensively and I'll go back in the box so it always ends up back in the box because you do so many tweaks these days you have no choice really. yeah. once I've decided which I'm going with mm. old school I start with the drums and bass and I will start from where that person is what they've given me and shape within that yeah because those reference mixes or rough mixes yeah. is what we're called they're not necessarily rough or reference mixes anymore are they now a lot of the sounds and stuff that are their plugins are the production yeah yeah sometimes people have, have, because of budgets they have to record very quickly it's changed it used yeah. to be you'd spend a long time recording and then mix it in a, in a day. Yeah. Now sometimes I think we spend longer mixing it than they've spent recording it because yeah, sure. that's the way it is. So a lot of the effects that are in the box are part of the production. So you can't really sweep the board and start again, I, 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 I find. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because they're almost partly mixing I from, think I, from the first That's it, from, from the beginning. Yeah, and I find that what I tend to do is There'll be a lot of stuff across the mix bus these days. That's okay. That that comes in, so I take that off, and I try and get it. My first thing would be trying to get it sound like the ref mix without the stuff on the mix bus. Okay. So, as you know, the, the mix bus makes it sound exciting, all the, yeah. the processing, but when it gets loud. It distorts you, the dynamics are gone, you're yeah. losing all the transients. So I try and get it to feel like that. If you, if you can get it to feel like that without the stuff on the mix bus, you're in a, good, you're in a great shape yeah. because you're getting all the, the air and the depth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, what the, the ref mixes generally nail is the excitement and the, what, they, what the producer yeah, wants to the hear. The intention. Yeah, the intention. Yeah. So you're working on your drums... Do you use any form of replacement or yeah. sample? Would I enhance? I don't, I don't replace. Yeah. We the first job, an assistant 
gets when they come to me is MIDI mapping. Right. So I don't use the quick replacements. I get them to MIDI map it. Okay. And that's like using contact or, or something like that? I use like battery. That. Battery, okay. Right. Battery and... Appropriately. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so they do that MIDI mapping, which is a skill in its own. Sure. Yeah. Making sure that you don't miss the ones. Also, sometimes when people have edited drums in a hurry, there'll be what I call a false transient at the beginning. Yeah. And when you do the the um, tab to transient, it'll go on the wrong one. Right. So it, the samples will be slightly off. So then you actually have to go and see, you'll see where the, the real transient is when you zoom in, and then you have to move them all. So it take, takes a while. Yeah. But then once you got them, it's all, you know, you can change samples, add samples, everything's face coherent. So that's quite meticulous. That's obviously very important, isn't it? Yeah. Getting that right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I've listened to a lot of your work over the years. Right. And your mixes always just have this incredible intensity to them that, for the love of God, I cannot get anywhere really? near. And I'm I'm very curious, and I'm going to ask you about a particular song in, in, in a minute, right. um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to try and see if you if you can shed some light on on that particular I song remember. i'm hoping you'll remember it. it's it's a great song how are you managing to get that intensity because are you using saturation are you driving the mix bus are you doing both are you using distortion somewhere i really don't know i generally don't like the way things sound okay. so i keep struggling to try and get it to a point where I, d I don't hate it, the way it sounds. I, and I kind of, I don't settle very easily on something. So I keep pushing myself to try and get it how I find it, how I want to hear it. Okay. Which sometimes I don't know. I just keep trying stuff. A lot of stuff doesn't work. So I just yeah, sure. keep trying stuff sure. until something happens. And sometimes you, you'll just be exasperated and try a piece of gear that you think you hate. Yeah. And then that, piece of gear just saves your bacon right i do like stuff to be quite intense i think it's from yeah i think you're shaped by the music you grow up with or yeah whatever. i mean you, you did a load of the, the the nine inch now stuff which was probably as intense as it could ever be yeah that's that's um, yeah one of my favorites i don't you know so i mean i'm sure there was an education a learning curve yeah. there from from trent you know yeah okay and from the Mary chain. Right, okay. And, yeah, and that's, so that was pretty good. carried that with you? Some good violence. Have you carried there? that? Some good violence. <laughs> good musical violence. Yeah, so. yeah. Have you carried that with you? you yeah, I, I, those are the bands I love. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I love that intense. I mean, but it's not to suggest that you only work with that band because you do nice, pleasant indie music. Yeah. Um, as well. It's it's not everything you do no, is no, kind of like... No, it's true, but you know. a lot of it is. No, a lot of it is, yeah, and for good measure, yeah. for, for good I, reason. I, I, I guess it's because I do get a lot of stuff that's quite dense. Right. That's okay. why people probably think, oh, this has got a hell of a lot of stuff on it. I'd probably be get good on for the doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. There's no, there's no real plan behind it all. Right. You're just, just trying stuff, and then when you feel the magic... Yeah, well, if I, well, okay, that's not working, let's try this. Yeah. Okay, that's not working, let's try this. Okay, that... I really wish it was... I know what to do with this one, because yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd be a lot quicker. I'm not very quick. How long does it take you to do a mix? Very, it varies. It's generally more than a day. More than a day? Okay. Generally. Generally a day to do battle with sounds. Right. And then the next day... It's a, I come in and it's a song again, okay. and you start. I hear it as a song, and I start yeah. to work on making it better as a song, yeah. rather than pulling my hair out about drums, which right, which 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 is what we all do. which we all do. Yeah, yeah. drums and bass, right? Here's drums it, and bass. Yes, we're all yes, going, yeah, how do we get that bass to yeah. sound good? Yeah, how do we get everything to sound clear? Yeah. The, the record that I wanted to talk about was Foles, mm -hmm. the Foles, and a particular record called What Went Down. That's mixed, yeah, that track. I love that track. Me too, it's one of my favourites. One of my favourite mixes too. What I love about that track is that when you get into the chorus, you've got what I can only describe as six, seven, eight, nine, ten dB of volume. Right. It literally just goes vroom. And 
how did you do how how did you do are you using automation continuously to push yes. into the mix bus yeah we do a, there's a lot of automation right that's one that again started on on the desk the, 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 to be fair the production's great and, and of course yeah. and the ref is it, is mix it james, I, james james ford, ford yeah and the ref mix i got was great we had to mix that album very quickly so it's probably i didn't have the luxury of stroking my beard over it i had to get on with it which sometimes is, is the best thing you yeah. know so i just tried to really extend their their ref mix yeah. and take it to the next stage and i, I love tracks i love the band yeah and i love amazing. i love Incredible. that track it was a great one to work on it wasn't that it actually wasn't that difficult i don't remember it being yeah. i don't remember there being a time for it to be difficult yeah. so it was just there was a lot of automation but it was all there really i'd, right, like, to, okay. I'd like to take all the credit for it but is there a piece of equipment that you use all the time or is there a favorite process that you're always using in the studio when it comes to your mixes what what is there something that you've that you carry with you, kind of from track to track, album to album, session to session? There's or has that changed? There's, they kind of change around. I've got an Alicia compressor that I really love, that I use on drums. Um, in, in, what, in what way do you use it on the drums? As a um, parallel. I love it because you can... It, there's an EQ filter on it, so you can send the kit to it and roll the top off so you don't get just the cymbals to it. Okay, yeah. I've got a new, newer one. I've got a Overstayer stereo compressor, which I love. That's got the filters on that Overstayers are kind of synth based rather than EQ based, so they have a different tone. And the compression on it, it's really, really good. And it's got a mix knob on it, which is okay. brilliant. So which that, is always helpful. Yeah. Those two things I'm really, I'm using a lot. Uh, I've got an EMI. Oh, Chandler EMR TG, TG1 compressor, which I love on vocals on limiter. It makes life hard for you because it brings out all the pops and the S's and the T's and all the dirt in between. Yeah. But singers seem to like... It gives it like a little bit of drive and it just sits it. Yeah. Do, do you use a lot of limiting in the mix? I use a bit. I, use, I don't use um, limiting much apart from... I guess I do, really. I mean, everyone yeah. does these days. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I yeah. use uh, the, the TG1 hardware, but I use some of the software ones. I use the uh, Renaissance Axe a lot on the on basses. The r bass, very simple yeah. kind of limiters. For uh, listening copies, I use yeah. the o Ozone 8 for the maximizer sometimes. That goes out to the client. Yeah, as, as sometimes a, as... I, it's either that, or if it's a rock band... I've got a Lavery Gold A to D, right. which is mint. It was the first piece of gear I bought for the, the studio. It's a fantastic A to D converter, and it's got a soft limit built in it. I don't think the new ones have, but this is like an analog soft limit and basically works on clipping rather than limiting too much. Okay. So you get 6 dBs. So that's that will be my listening copy. We'll go through and that. that. goes out to the clients before mastering. And then, and then you take we send off, that to mastering, and then we send the unlimited one to mastering. Yeah, sure. Sometimes they use the limited one. Sometimes what, what's, what's your... Is there a, a, a consistent mix bus that you use? Not really. Um, on on the desk, when yeah. I'm on the desk, I have a Obsidian compressor, which is okay. like the SSL one, very like the SSL one, but it's got a high-pass filter in it. Okay, and I think it, I think this SSO one sounds great for drums. This one sounds better for guitars. And do you use an EQ? Have you got? A I have master a G EQ GML or? across the mix, but I quite often don't EQ anymore. Since I got okay. weirdly enough, since I got Pro Tools twelve, or then the HDX, right? I'm using less EQ across the mix bus. Okay, Which, so the converters. I was gutted be, when yeah. I spent all that money on Pro Tools of Twelve <laughs> and HDX. I thought, Christ, I could buy a great car for this. <laughs> then I got, I came in and Caesar had fixed it all up for me. So I'm very lucky. So I came in and listened and thought, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty good actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then suddenly I thought, you know, actually I'm glad I did oh, it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm EQ in the mix a lot less. Okay, interesting. So, That's but then when we print the stems, that all comes off. So, How? Oh, I, actually, I do run through a, a Varimu. As compressor. well, yeah, which yeah. doesn't compress. I just like this; they're running through it, so that goes. That's that's on when the stems are printed. So no compression, 
no no actual game reduction not really no just just okay. the tone of it yeah sure um so but then it get when he goes back in the box i'll either put the obsidian back on yeah or replace it with a software one like glue which the glue is oh yes i know this that's one very that's, very yeah. similar to the obsidian yeah and well it's it's, it's, it's modeled on the ssl isn't it it's a it's, it's got on the high pass it's got the high pass yeah so i has been around use, for a long time actually it's, it's, it's a good, good little compressor it's really good plugin, so i'll yeah. either use that and then the ozone, just, just for a, a bit of EQ. Just a, just a bit of volume. Sometimes, sometimes I'll put a bit of um, the uh, multiband compressor on it, just to... My SSL can bring out those cymbal frequencies okay. that make your teeth hurt a little right. bit. Sort of so sometimes I'll just use a very gentle bit of that to calm those frequencies. Okay, interesting. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> And um, when you stem off your work, mm -hmm. you said that you do some intricate stems. How how detailed are we talking about here? Are we talking about literally individual, every single track? And what about uh, reverbs? Well, we will... The drums now will be stemmed individually. We worked out a system where I can stem the kick snare separately. And then what will happen is what's across the drum bus will go back on. Okay. We'll stem them with that off. Okay, right. But it'll go through, sometimes I run it through to generate some Helios for the line amps rather than the SSL. Oh, okay. And uh, it just makes it a bit more open. And so sometimes I've got uh, an inward connection EQ that will sometimes do the bottom and top. So they'll be printed through those. Yeah. And then they go back in. So the drums will be... I mean, if there's a top and bottom mic, that'll be printed as one. Yeah, sure. So it's not all... Sure, yeah. It's just the core, like the kick, the, the snare, snare, the tom, the overheads, the rooms, they'll all be printed separately. Then the guitars, obviously, if there's separate mics, they'll be bounced to a stereo rather than okay. all the separate right. mics. Okay. And the bass will be one. So yeah. And what about your reverbs? Are you printing guitars with effects or are you separating your effects out even with your stems? No, uh, on the vocals they'll be separated out. Okay, like I've, got a, I've got an EMT plate that we'll use and that'll be, that'll be yeah. stemmed separately and the, I've got an AMS uh, DMX okay. 15 which yeah. I love. I would, that'll be recorded. So all the effects will be recorded. Okay. All right. So it's, it's, it's literally the mix in the box. Yeah, but also the, all the yeah, all the vocal effect reverbs will be recorded as well. Somebody stays up all night doing it. Tom, now. It was Caesar. Now, Tom. One track at a time. Yeah. Four minutes. We call it Stem Party for One. <laughs> You've got the glitter ball. You can put that on. Listen, you can have a whole party. I leave about nine or ten o'clock. and See you tomorrow, Tom. And he's still here at nine he, or ten yeah, o'clock. Right. He's here pretty late, yeah. <laughs> have you got any sort of suggestions for things to try to avoid rather than things to try to do? Well, we've touched on it with limiting. You get reference mixes that are so fucking loud now. Yeah. And I understand why. We all understand why. But it, it starts... Then, but then what happens is you feel like you have to compete with it because can you trust the people to... When you're listening back, to not compare it on their laptop to their reference mix and be just impressed by the volume. So if you can calm that down... And sometimes limiting is used to make up for poor production. The excitement comes from limiting rather than right. a performance or the sounds. Okay. Which, again, I understand we're all up against the time crunch. But the hard work you put in at the beginning makes everything else better and everything goes down the line feeling better. That you... So I just say just try to avoid not crushing the life out of everything. I don't see how you have too many problems with the loudness of your records compared to others. Cause well, you, you do. Yours are pretty loud. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> only right up there. That's only, but that's only because. <laughs> how do you deal with that? Okay, so say you know your client comes in and has got a rough mix, and it's you know seven decibels of of gain on on the limiter, and it's just absolutely you know squared off completely. The how, how do you deal with that in terms of not necessarily? your style of mixing because you're not going to change what you do to, to compete with it but you, have said, to, you have to compete with it do you ever have to end up having to say to the client don't listen to the rough mix for volume because it's not going to be that I will say I couldn't get my mix as loud your mix is 2 dBs louder than mine 
So if you're comparing it to an, to that mix down two dBs. Okay, yeah. And I'll explain why. I don't want to sound like somebody who's saying, oh, modern, this is how modern life is. It's This bottle's been there since the 60s. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. people trying to, we're using limiting and trying to get things loud. And there's yeah. always the, all oh, the Americans get more bottom end on their tracks and they're louder in the 60s. It's, it's been going on forever. Okay. It's just a different, it's just different set of rules now or a different set of toys. Are you referring to the rough uh, the I ref reference mix I ref a lot while you're working? A lot, yeah. I okay. do, re I ref yeah. the reference mix a lot. That's interesting for people to, to think because I think, you know, when you're starting out mixing, uh, you know, we all have that. You, you're never sure if what you're doing is good. When I started you know. out, I used to A, B to CDs all the time. Okay. I would, uh, I think when I went, I went to the Smashing Pumpkins and I remember the first day we were listening to stuff we'd done and Butch Fig was playing some mixes he'd done or he'd worked on and they were listening to some of mine and I thought, hmm, I got a lot. I got some stuff to learn here. And so I started A, being constantly to records that I thought sounded amazing. Generally yeah. Andy Wallace work. Andy, Andy Wallace, Wallace yeah, was course. the yeah. bane of my fucking life. I kept Have you ever worked with him? No, yeah. I met him once, which was, a very, <laughs> which was I, did, I told him that he was the bane of my life as well. Because I used to listen to his drum sound and just kind of collapse how good it always sounded. His drums and bass always sound killer. Yeah. Everything sounded killer with him. He's brilliant. He was yeah. like a big, a massive um, hero to me. So okay. I had A-B to his work a lot. Uh, it used to be, um, it was Nirvana, and yeah. then it was uh, the first Rage Against Machine yeah, album. Which is unbelievable. Phenomenal. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, the, the, that record does sound just absolutely incredible. Yeah. So it made work a lot less fun because you were constantly going, oh, Christ, and it made it very it, it kind of technical a lot for, right. the, for the first day yeah, trying sure. to get that thing. But it made at least you knew you were in. If you were competing with that, you were in a good place. I don't do that so much now because no. I know my room so well. Yeah, but now I ab to the rough mix a lot. And and if you're let's excuse me, let's say you are comparing yourself to Andy Wallace, how do you try to work out what to do? Like what's I don't know. You, <laughs> That's again, a trouble. Again, again, you're like, okay, let me just work. try work with the snare. You think why you couldn't know? I be an Andy Wallace? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. assist. laughs> <laughs> That's a, phone him up. It's like, ah. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just you're just trying stuff, fiddling you're, around. You're, you're yeah. not you're not overthinking. Are, are you overthinking angry. it, or are you just just going at the board and just saying, okay, or are you remembering something that you you saw or tried five years ago six weeks ago i can't remember what happened yesterday so, <laughs> I, so, so it's literally the process isn't it's a isn't, frustrating isn't a, process of trying stuff out fiddling getting annoyed and uh trying more stuff somehow out. getting there getting to a point where you you don't hate it or you, you you're in the ballpark and that's once you got to that point it's like you can start to enjoy yourself a bit yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. But before it's war, I would say it's war up till then. Okay, it's you versus the, you versus you the track. Versus the track. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great place to leave it. Alan, Thanks, it's Kevin. absolutely a pleasure. I think you're going to share lots of stuff that people are really going to enjoy. I hope so. And uh, you've got a great thing here with the studio. and um, I'm very proud of it. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Mix Bus with me, Kevin Paul. Don't forget to give us a five-star rating and subscribe to the whole series on Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts. Remember to join me for the next episode, and until then, goodbye. <laughs>